started right here. Uh, meeting OSC Dev Team Tuesday, November 28th. So just a few topics here, MicroTrack, LifeTrack, and any other progress planning for next year. Um, going to the working doc, I'm going to just paste that into the chat. Uh, that's the working doc. So, um, yeah, let's see, who do we have here? Just you. Let, yeah, let's just keep going, keep going. So the latest updates are, uh, let's take a look at page one. So the development team hours. Uh, yeah, definitely a little trail trail down for the end of the year as we, we near Christmas here, but we'll need it because next year is going to be ambitious. So uh, pretty much planning on a redoubled schedule for next year, thinking about growth of OSE. I've been doing some planning and thinking about it, and what, what I'd like to do is post a schedule for next year's events probably by like February 1st to have the whole calendar filled out. Uh, we ran a few good workshops starting almost a regular 3D printer workshop this year, and we're going to continue that, and then adding some of the other ones, like the MicroTrack is quite promising. I mean, the machine is working really well so far, uh, and adding more of the brick press, looking at it, the house builds back to that. I mean, we, we're near to complete finishing of the Seed Eco Home right here, and it's beautiful, absolutely outstanding, I must say, in terms of all the systems, the PV, the hydronics, the water system. Um, the electrical system, how efficient it is, the aquaponics that are going to be finished there. Um, it's the biodigester. So very promising results. And, and I think we're, you know, like I always say, we're almost ready for prime time. And it's, it's building. I mean, we're kind of having this long period of incubation to get uh, a lot more activity going. But I was thinking that one, one way to simply double our impact and the impact is such that from the workshops, we get a lot of people finding out about our work and some people joining the team, um, but we just got to keep going and creating that economic impact and, and simply doubling the number of workshops uh, would be one way to do that just by placing a regular workshop on a, on a calendar every, every month, as well as uh, getting finally to that, that immersion training program that I've been talking a lot about in the sense that we need other people to be doing this for their livelihood. And I think it's definitely possible. I mean, um, on average, uh, OSC, like as far as our budget, I mean, we've been doing about 100K per year. I mean, that's that's not a lot. I mean, there was a bunch of foundation funding, and after the TED Talk and all that, a bunch of money came in at that time where in like the, that three-year or four-year period, we, we brought in like a million bucks or so from all these foundations and grants. We hired some people, money ran out. Now we're going back strong to the bootstrap funding where that's the way to scale the project, as I mentioned. It's like we're not going to grow this by foundation money. This is about um, getting this off the ground by a real economic activity that people can bootstrap. In other words, we could be unlimited in terms of our scalability if we teach others to bootstrap and fund their operations in an ongoing way, just like we have done here, where we're doing workshops, producing things, making some products for sale, some some the educational experience. So between the production and education, that business model I think is there and it's it's ready to be replicated. So that's that's kind of how we're going. Um, so going into uh, just continuing on a workshop schedule, uh, I'm actually going to be away the next two weeks. So. Um, I'm not sure about the meetings. I'm not sure I'm going to have the access to the internet. But ha Lex, um, what do you think? Should we try to have the meeting in the next couple of weeks, or Lex and Abe, you guys no, are? No, I mean, if, if, if this meeting is any indication, uh, I think everyone else is also on vacation. Yeah, yeah, people are taking off on vacation. Maybe, maybe yeah, we take off, uh, have a little, little bit of rest for the holidays here. Um, I am going to be back about the 14th of December. Maybe we can try uh, getting back on, um, on a meeting schedule there. That's, that's Christmas week, but we can definitely try to check in, see where we are, maybe have some inspiring uh, <laughs> conversation at that point. Um, so yeah, let's, let's keep that. Um, I'm going away to Costa Rica and Belize for the next two weeks, and that is, main thing there is a, a workshop opportunity there. There's some collaborators down there. Uh, we're looking at a tractor build and a brick press build down there and potentially for getting ready for building some housing now. But it's an interesting opportunity and potential potential site for a future OSE branch indeed. So it's there's a lot of potential there. And definitely I'm interested in running workshops in different places, which is pretty much the first time that we're going to be taking the big machine builds elsewhere if this actually happens. We've done some... Um, 
some 3D printer workshops on a regular basis almost. Uh, the big machines we have hardly done, and we've done one build in Wisconsin one time, that was a few years ago. Uh, but as far as traveling to remote locations, I think that's, that's a good thing to do because, you know, there's many, many places that people would like to get heavy, heavy equipment built or houses built, which we, obviously for the houses, you would have to travel uh, to, to build in other locations. So, so that's interesting, just trying to get to a more broad international schedule as far as the project goes. Um, so that's going to be next two weeks exploring that opportunity, which would be great if it works out. As far as just basic uh, progress here um, on the micro track, so um, field testing is my report. I've been, um, what I've done so far is actually I had to make a, some adjustments. So uh, I switched out the power cube because um, put in a smaller pump so we can get higher PSI. The tracks just didn't have enough drive torque. So I switched out from a 0.92 cubic inch to a 0.67 cubic inch hydraulic pump, which means it gave us the full 3,000 PSI as opposed to like 2,000 PSI. Uh, that definitely helps. So right now, I also uh, switched the loader mounting as far as the bucket mounting. I moved the top pinhole down two inches because the dump of the bucket was not happening. It was only going down to about 45 degrees. So by moving the top mount point of the bucket cylinders, I was able to get the full 180 degree dump, meaning that you're dumping the bucket straight vertically down. So that was pretty much spent this week uh, modifying the equipment and I'm ready to go, go back out. But as you, you see here, it's machines working relatively well. Uh, in one pass, I can pretty much go through like six inches of soil, uh, kind of bulldozer duty. So that's, that's pretty good for a very small machine like this. And I'm gonna continue that to dig the drainage trench. So that's that's in progress. Uh, positive results, I mean, the machine is good. Like I put a little pedestal for driving on the back of the tractor, basically an operator stand with the levers in front of that. So um, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. And as far as the power cube switch out, that was pretty good. Basically put a hoist to it, lifted out the power cube and replaced the pump and put the power cube back in. So that was, that was relatively decent. Okay, as far as the, so that kind of covers the micro track. What I'm going to be doing today and basically today is dig that drainage trench to, so basically get some good data points on real functionality in the field. Like you see in the picture on page five, I've just started that, but I'm going to continue that today. So as far as live track, um, any updates on that here? Do we have, um, Abe, anything on that? Or because uh, Roberto was fixing up Let's see, did Roberto do anything on that? Um, on live track? Yeah. I think I saw some updates. Yep, Roberto, go ahead. But I've not looked at that much. I've been looking at the power cube. Yep. Uh, some, although I, I keep saying I'm going to add it, re at this power cube to be more modular, and I'm working on that now. But I've had yeah, some slowness last week, and I had some technical difficulties this weekend. Mm -hmm. hardware wise but um i think i'm recovered from that so uh, i plan on getting a lot more done on the power cube but I, I, there are some things I'd like to discuss on that uh the the live track um see i haven't i, I think i saw the last edit or you did that sure i need to open that file mm -hmm. it looked like um had some chain. I think we looked at that before. It was more like the bobcat design with the longer arms. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we went through that. Uh, little update that we had there was just moving the range of the the tensioner up a little bit. So I'm assuming if Roberto's not here, maybe he did not um, do much work. Let's see, Roberto, anything from him? Um, Right, so he's he's working on a 3D printer. I guess he's building that out. Um, haven't seen any messages on the progress of the, the big tractor. Now, still for the big tractor, we are looking at uh, March, April, somewhere around there for the build of that. So that's definitely a priority for getting this real big machine up and up and running properly. And it's good that we're doing the micro track with a 16 or 18 horsepower right now because that really shows the limits of what you can do with the, the lower amount of horsepower and still a, a functional smaller machine. 
leading towards the stacking of these machines together to make the larger machine. Like you know, we've talked about it as a stackability, scalability of these machines. I think there's going to be good insight coming from that as far as the uh, stackability aspect. Basically, like for every small drive unit, 16 horsepower, you know, um, and then times four that 64 or so. Okay. Yep. So, yeah, let's see, where was I? Yep. Um, November 27th. Oh, yeah, no, Roberto does have an update here. Uh, raised loader arms. Yeah, I'm, I'm downloading that, but yeah, he, he does have an update on that. Anything to, um, do you have any uh, CAD updates on the power cube, or you didn't get much on that, because maybe we can just keep going if, unless you've got some specific questions on that. So, yeah, we can talk about that. I, I started to kind of just do that file, uh, which I linked to in the document, and it's of course embedded on my log. Power Q modularity logic. Uh, I, I didn't want to just assemble the power game. I mean, we've got time and we're kind of regrouping. I figure we've got a ways to do this. So I was thinking more about the design of it, some of the issues we've had with the, the differences between the CAD and the workshop, and I've been improving and figuring out, I think, a lot of the CAD stuff better. I think I've been learning how to use that better, and um, so I was trying to figure out more uh, ways to improve the workflow and get it more editable, because I constantly spend a lot of time going back and editing, making changes to all these modules, so it seems like they need to be more modular and editable and so on. So, see about the main thing right now I'm trying to do is separate the tank from the cube. It's kind of like, it's that way anyway, but the CAD wasn't that way. And so, I think there was some, to some degree there was, um, I was thinking that originally it was going to be like CNC cut sheets, kind of like 3D printers, four sides, and the six sides. Yeah, there's... Yes, Four that's five, that's I definitely what we want to do. Bottom, yes, bottom yes. Up. Let me interrupt you but there. Yes. The tank. Yeah. Well, Abe, yeah. I mean, that's what we do want to do. That is once the when we have the CNC torch table running that, and this time around we just didn't have the CNC torch table. But that is the efficient way to do that. At that point, you need six pieces, all the holes, including the hydraulic reservoir holes and the holes for mounting the engine and everything else are finished in those six pieces so that's the efficient way to do it and of course we didn't do that that's why you know in those four days we could only build the the micro track we were aiming initially to build the other tractor as well because i mean realistically it does take one to two days once you have um, all the parts cut efficiently it's it just doesn't take so there's only so many parts to the to the whole design but um so, so you're referring to breaking down a CAD into a better modularity. So, so the first question would be like, under the power cube, do we, did you start like a, so the part library should reflect the breakdown of the modules, right? So did you update that to say, okay, this is uh, the better breakdown? Is that kind of updated? I uploaded like a new frame design that's editable before. Okay. That was basically last week. And, yeah. and I'm trying to redesign because you said six sides. Of course, that seems yeah. simple, but I'm wondering about the torch versus just it looked like I was looking at photos of the cube. Yep. And it looks like it's a different combination of things welded together, maybe from the previous photo. There's some older photos that I have, I think, that are that you posted. What was it? P, it was PC17.08, which I think had that log splitter. Uh, thing in it, which I think changed and stuff, but the photos of the frame was always considered, considered first because, you know, trying to get um, six pieces, it sounds so cool if you cut it with a CNC torch table, the, maybe is it simpler, how, how hard is that compared to it look like just chopping pieces of um, uh, metal on the iron worker, you know, and tacking that together. Um, you know, yeah, the answer is... It makes is, more labor in the workshop, but I don't know that that's an issue. I mean, is it more expensive to run the torch table just for some thin metal okay. sheets than have somebody run the ironworker? Plus, it's not like there were issues with the tank being welded. So I thought the tank, if there's six sides, the tank is like part of 
the sides and all that, and that's the way it is in the CAD, too. And I was thinking, well, we should separate the tank as a separate parallel module to the frame and then weld the frame and the tank together later. That way they can be done in parallel. It might reduce uh, assembly issues, welding issues, but... That, that's kind of what I was thinking about. I, I yeah, okay, well, let me... Uh, think right, well, let me uh, provide the feedback on that because the feedback is very simple. What you're proposing is going to take five to ten times more time, and that's based on our experience. Because if you have all those pieces, they still have to be measured. Yes, cutting is easy, and uh, it's probably even cheaper to do it from stock materials because torch cutting, if you're going to outsource that, that's more expensive. If you have it in-house... It's actually not more expensive, though you get waste like of the inner cutout pieces, which if you don't use them elsewhere, the torch cutting is actually going to be ex more expensive in materials, but not on the actual labor because the labor is going to be, you pretty much hit run. But I mean, that's what we thought it, you know, we'd think that, okay, well, you just got to cut them. But in practice, in a workshop, there is a lot of um, uh, just the steps for cutting and measuring and the number of pieces and then but not not that that's actually the easy part the harder part is the alignment because once you have the four pieces for example for one side that's square in order to make that a square you're going to have to do precise angles to align and measure that so it's exactly square and it fits fits completely and then any anywhere that you're off you're just going to get little gaps so what we found is that i mean i can tell you right now six sides for a 3d printer five minutes to weld Manually, if I had to do that by, and we've done that with a power cube, if we had to do that manually, laying it up, the part that's difficult is actually laying it up, first squaring it up, and then making it into a three-dimensional shape. So you talk about five, five minutes versus about one hour to two hours. I mean, that's just the experience. So while it okay. sounds like... That, now there's a second point. To know. Okay, second point, though. Okay. There's a very important second point to that. You said, how about we modularize the tank because... That way we can do it in parallel. That sounds like a good idea. However, then you get into the issue, like once you weld the tank, if you're gonna weld the other pieces to the pieces that you, to the tank that's already welded, there's a risk of upon the second weld, you're actually gonna put holes into the place where you're welding the other pieces to the tank. So the procedure that you'd be referring to there is you, you weld the tank, then you'd pressure test it to make sure that it's got no holes. But the problem is that after you weld the four, there's actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You, no, let's see. There's gonna be one, two, three. Well, there's gonna be like four long welds. No, no, I mean, but there's gonna be welds, like there's a bunch of welds. And the difficult part about welding is wherever you start and stop, like say you wanna weld any of those thin long pieces to the tank you're you're simply putting a risk of making puncture holes little pinholes in the tank itself so while it sounds good like the only way you could do that without making that risk is if you offset the weld location to a different place where you're actually not welding around the prior weld so while that sounds you know like in principle it sounds like parallel would be good it's not in this case because upon joining those together you run the risk of puncturing making little pinholes and then you basically have to redo the welding. That's the part that kills it when you have to do redo that too many okay. times. I did kind of get the pinhole thing. It sounds like it, it's a thinner metal and it's easy to put holes in it. So maybe the current design is, is pretty good then and I just need to do more assembly. I did also kind of think about the way that it's assembled in the CAD in detail. So hopefully all those parts then can just be used as DXFs or whatever for the torching. Um, and I also detailed it where the assembly was different. I have offsets and I've been doing using a lot more constraints. So thinking about the way that the pieces can be clamped together for welding, because I assume that's an issue. Well, you actually, if you... The, the physical... Well, if you talk about the six pieces that are accurate and already cut, it's relatively easy. Like the way we did it with, uh, with the 3D printers we simply put magnet magnet holders on each side and that pretty much as long as the edges are straight i mean they they just fit right together and just weld it and it's really quick so that's that's definitely big learnings about how easy that is and and in fact that's the reason why 
we're migrating towards that after finding out how easy that is. And, and it wasn't that easy before, even yeah. using the angles, as I mentioned in another meeting, using angles is not as easy because for angles, you have to have 12 angle pieces to make a cube out of them. And to make each of those corners exactly square and straight, that's the part that takes all the time. So, so one, you cut down the number of parts from 12 to six, and then the alignment is pretty easy because it's, the point is the bottom line, self-aligning. As long as all those edges touch, they can only be good. <laughs> it can only be correct, you know? So, so that's, that's kind of the summary of it. Okay, that, that sounds good. I think what I have on some of that CAD is probably pretty good then for what you're saying. So yeah, um, I did get it assembled where the corners meet up different. Um, the magnet sounds like that, that makes things easier. So and I think the way that I actually designed it in the CAD will work well okay. with that because I... I assembled the edges together so that if it's sitting down on a tabletop in the CAD, it makes sense to be welded just the way it is. Before the CAD, it was like the corners weren't, they, there was no overlap. And I assume sometimes with the welds, you kind of need a groove to run a bead in. That That's most I know about welding. don't have a lot of experience with that yet. but Yeah, you can weld it uh, like if, if you don't have a... If you don't have a groove, you can weld it on the inside, for example. Like if you butt them up like right next to each other, you can you can weld them on the inside, so you don't really yeah. need that stuff. Okay, I'm just I'm looking at your log. I'm missing where the power cube that would be um seventeen ten. I'm missing that. Do you have a link to your your modular power cube there? I'm seeing P You're breaking PCs. up a little. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. Is there, that let's see the link because I'm seeing PC1708 frame module on no November 19th, but this should be 1710, I... right? Oh, okay, so the, the label. Yeah, I think I uploaded an editable version of the frame 1708. I'm not sure there is 1710. I, I wonder oh, what, let's see. what we're probably getting off on our versioning. Um, well, let's be careful about that. Uh, PowerCube version 17.10 should be on the, on the, let's see if it has CAD there. So we still want to keep calling it 17.10. Well, so 17.08 was the one that went off to Utah for the brick press. The 17.10 was slightly different, so you got to, I mean, those are different. You can say that every version is a fork in some way, so we got to take that yeah. back to uh, the next yeah. one. That's something else I was thinking about was the yeah. broader design of the cube and the version because uh, if we can make it more modular and I mean I think that just trying to get it more edible in CAD and match match the CAD closer to what's actually done in the workshop that that will make a big difference but well yeah honestly, yeah there's always going to be different versions so yeah well I um, think um, so so let me just share share the conclusions on what what we think that should be like. Uh, so far, the the issues have been when uh, we start a new project and then you have to start from scratch on everything. But the easiest way to go from there is you start with an existing file and modify it to to be exactly the same as as the well the, uh, reflecting all the new changes. And because there's typically going to be a lot of changes in different places, you want to just make sure you've got. Um, all the parts labeled for that particular version because it's gonna because at the end of the day it becomes hard like for example if you're using version 17.10 for say the frame and then you're saying oh but but the you know but the other part you know say the cooler is still 17.08 it got, kind of gets confusing so we want to update it nonetheless and typically there's changes like little changes on everything because we still haven't stabilized yet to the super final version so we do want to carry forward everything and and be redundant on on the versioning so it's simply easy for somebody like somebody does not have to have any other information outside of knowing this is version 17.10 that's what we found was the easiest to do otherwise people get confused like what do you use with what so you want to keep to that but I'm noticing on PowerCube version 17.10 I don't see a file there so let's if you want to just start that file and put everything if you wouldn't mind starting that and a, and a part library I mean unfortunately it's it's that that extensive but 
but I mean, we have to do that simply because we're rolling out one prototype after another. And with hardware, because you're changing, I mean, we're still changing a lot of things. We still want to, yeah, we want to make sure that we carry forward everything and, and keep it simple. But we do have to, we do have to put in the new, uh, new versions and just copy them over yeah. so it's easy to manage simply. I mean, that's, that's what we found works yeah. best. Otherwise, it kind of gets confusing. I see. 1710 yep. power cube wiki page so i think i'll put the file there and yeah, i had it under yeah, 1708 and that's that i guess there was no power cube 1710 file so right uh, right yeah I'll so let's let's definitely there. do that uh because at 17.10 a so so with that so so let's talk about the versioning just a little bit because um for 1708 We've got the, let's see, is the CAD up there? Where, where is that CAD? Uh, the part library, yes, there's a PC1708 master. 1710 is what we're currently using in, in Microtrack version 17.10. Now, there, we want to make sure that we get the version exactly as we have as built. So if you are actually making the larger one, which means the one that accepts, because I believe right now you're making the one for the, the, the life track itself, which is going to be 18.04. So if you're actually working on that, that should be more like PC. Um, you know, you can, you can start it by, uh, you can name it by like when you're working on it. And I think you, you could either call it like 17.11 it's probably like best to do it 1711 since that's the new version right now because we don't know when that build is, is exactly going to be. So I think you sh you're actually at 1711. Now 1710 is going to have to be the exact and update then, of what we have for the one that we have in a, in a micro track right now. So there's work there too. Yeah, you broke up a little bit. I think I understood. Um, the, I guess I'll name the, the, the larger one for the life track 1711. Yeah, 1711, um, I, let's do that. There were some files that I copied. I got a bunch of information out of to edit and stuff. I don't know if it was labeled 1708 or 1710. I can't remember how that, where I got the original files, which I adapted. And I I yep. redrew stuff so it was more edible. But, um, that, that cube, the large one, isn't actually that big. I think that was one thing I noticed in the life track was it had a really large cube on top. Uh -huh. As far as I know, there's there's no reason for it to be bigger than the 20 by 30. Okay. Um, I don't think there's a reason to increase the tank size or anything well, like that that I can we see. We want to have, I can say that for the 64 horsepower version, we want to have 10 gallons of fluid, definitely. I think right now we're at, we're at the size of 7.5 gallons, meaning three quarters filled. Like like the four by six, uh, sorry, the four inch wide reservoir which we currently have, that is um, when two about two thirds full. That's about seven gallons. So we do want to increase it to six inches at least. Um, so that we do want to do because uh, yeah, five gallons gets a little. It's a little pushing it. That's that's what we have. Well, yeah. I mean, like the. Well, I assume you yeah. can. To some extent, you can keep filling it, but I don't know how much. You know how full you with the tank. Yeah, it's you don't want to. I mean, it's just a reservoir. It's a reservoir, so, but if you if it sloshes around, the 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 tank cap actually uh, can spill. So you don't want it to be too full. You want to be like two thirds, or so. Yeah. Okay. Or like three quarters. Because I assume if there's a system with all these sub cubes um on the main cube you would yeah you would have to fill it i don't know what the filling process is like for a whole bunch of connected cubes i'm sure you have to fill it as much as you can and just keep pouring more in is what i assume it'll keep suctioning from the reservoir but um yeah a bigger reservoir I, I guess i'll increase the size of the tank in it's the size of the frame are like four inches now i can go to several several inches and i think there's still room and I can keep most of the inches of the cube the same. Yeah, I, think, I mean, yeah. just so, just one note. Yeah. Let me explain a tank sizing. In principle, you don't need any any tank at all if the volume of your hydraulic fluid didn't change. It, it could be very minimal. Like, for example, if you have hydraulic motors, they are always filled. So the volume, like if you're just running hydraulic motors, 
the volume uh, in the system does not change. However, if you're running cylinders, the concept is if you fill up a, a cylinder completely, that means you've sucked a lot of fluid out of the reservoir. You need fluid to fill up a cylinder. So if you have a bunch of cylinders in a system, I don't know, some crazy machine's got a huge number of cylinders, then you totally drain the tank of all the fluid. So you have to have enough reserve that you're never getting into an issue with the idea that if the tank sloshes around, you don't want it to be so low that you get an air pocket and you're sucking air into the system. So it's not good. It destroys, it's not good for the pump. So, but, but like 10 gallons, okay. I can say that the first life track one, which was actually a 50, 50 horsepower engine, that's before we really went modular on it. We had um, about a 10 gallons of hydraulic fluid in that system. So, yeah, about about a 10 gallon reservoir. So we we'd want to go for about 10 gallons at this point. Yeah, a little little okay, wider. I'll so. increase the size of that. Then that'll make the frame size. Uh, of course, I know gra gravity feed is uh, important since this larger cube. It's going to be on top, so. Um, but I think um, making it taller. I could make it taller too, but. Yeah, uh, we. I don't know if that's better than thicker. Yeah, the taller. Uh, we're gonna just have to make sure that regarding the tall, uh, just the learnings from version seventeen point ten, are that after we put on the rubber mounts for the engine, which were about one inch tall we ended up not being able to fit the hydraulic cooler on a top. It was just too close. So that's the only thing we want to be very careful about. After you put the, the metal grate there to mount the cooler and the fan, I mean, the fan is so thick and the cooler is so thick, we have to have enough space that, that we're above the engine. And, and uh, the muffler, you also have to pay attention to the location of the muffler because the muffler is really hot. So you don't want the hot muffler right next to the hydraulic cooler. Yeah. But besides that, there's no need to go f go taller. Uh, I think for low center of gravity altogether for the machines, uh, we care about a lot about low center of gravity for safety. So the, the smaller in terms of height, the better in general. Okay. You keep breaking up sporadically, but I think I get the gist of that. So yeah, I'll just, instead of making it taller, I'll, I'll make it um, wider or not, well, not the whole cube. I, I can increase the size of the tank within the existing cube uh, size. So, yep. well, yep. and then wait, no, that there is a problem with that actually. Now that I'm looking at it, um, the the larger cooler does barely fit in there. Right. right okay. So okay. Yeah. So let's discuss yeah, that I've part. Got it in there. Yeah, I saw that. Well, it's it's pretty it much. Barely fits. Yeah, it's pretty much barely fitting in there. So what I would suggest there, I mean, what do you think about the idea of having the cooler in front of the air intake and have then individual coolers on each power cube? Because that would address the electricity issue in these power cubes. I'm somewhat inclined because of this, this real l large size of that one cooler, and you're right about that, that's just a little hard because after you put the cooler on top, note that you cannot take the engine out. From the top the, t the engine typically kind of goes in from the top well you actually have it on the side there yeah I see. and putting the cooler especially the big one on the side of the engine in front of the air intake there hmm. that may that be might... good for cooling but it it does block access i think i mentioned before to right it looks like maybe some oil and dipsticks and access to maintain certain things on the engine so it looks like you'd have to yeah disassemble the cooler out of the cube to get to the engine to maintain it. Like yeah. Obviously the, the you know air what? intake filter and oil dipsticks there and so on. Yeah. I don't know. I'd be inclined to say what if we just use the smallest cooler and then have each power cube have its own cooler. And that means we're adding... Okay. I think they're like, for the smallest cooler, I think it's like, uh, it's around a hundred bucks on Amazon. Um, 1240 okay, Hayden. So back to small coolers on each one and but but have them fanless just in front yeah. of the air intake yeah yeah i think that might be a good idea then, just because as you're seeing we're having um, issues well look at that it's only 63 dollars yeah. 
Hayden Automotive 1240 duty heavy duty oil coolers sixty three dollars that's not bad at all let's just do that because the big one itself is like hundred eighty or so we're not not actually being you know not actually costing the big one is costing as much as almost the you know three of the small ones yeah definitely yeah okay that yeah I noticed that larger one was more um, 12, yeah. um, eliminating the big one that does not eliminate some issues so yeah I guess as long as the smaller ones in the air intake works and I can probably position the smaller one uh, in front of the air intake but maybe so that it's not in the way of some of the other stuff below there so right we only need access to the pool cord which is um, you pull it from the side you don't pull it forward yeah. you pull it to the side so see I think, I think yeah I think I saw how those coolers were bolted in it looked like you just ran screws through them with washers uh, to a grill in those photos anyway so Oh, well, yeah, so, yeah, there's some kind of mount. So you've got um, the 12, which cooler, the large one is called 1284? Is that what it is? Well, um, I, I think I'm looking, the, the pictures that I've been looking at are the 17 or 8 photos, which I believe is the smaller 1240. Okay. I think that's the 1240. So, yeah, I would say. Uh, back on 17. Yeah. For the 1240, price is not too bad. I think let's do it. That's not, the cost doesn't add so much to cost. It does add to the overall complexity, but just the idea of that thing being so large and so unwieldy there and blocking just about everything, that power cube would have to be really large to make everything easily accessible. So I would go and, and simplify and go back to the, the deeper modularity, just the, you know, the lower level modularity, which means that more of the components are, are on each unit. Um, let's do that. Yeah, keep them more the same. Although, yeah, yeah, let's see, would... on the smaller tanks, we do increase the size of the tank. Uh, we, well, we don't need the tanks on the smaller tanks. No, That's we don't, we don't. Difference. Right, right, so that'll be so, pretty, close to sim pretty close to being identical, except having a tank versus not. So that actually is good for the overall okay. system. We're not using two different coolers and so forth. So that's good. And then remember for the big power cube, we still want to have four suctions and four returns uh, that we want to be able to accommodate. Yeah. Yep. And those, those need to fit into the tank, don't they? Yeah. Yep. yep. Fittings yep. into the tank directly because that's um, sturdier than a bunch of other plumbing, I guess. Yeah, it's easy to, like, we found that if you go directly, just a simple fitting and then a quick coupler back to the tank, that's pretty convenient, as opposed to getting in a, you know, like one fitting and then you're teeing off it and, you know, multiple tees. One, they're easier to break off, and two, you have to worry about leakage holes at every... Nah, it's, it's mainly that it's just that straight in back to the tank is just really easy easy to implement. Where, where you start getting a lot of T's and everything, it kind of gets messy and a little harder to work with. So just the minimum unit. Um, I think, I think the, the return straight in and the suction straight out makes it very easy because we've done before where we we've done one one fitting and then like tee it off but with all the fittings there like especially on the suctions which are typically like pretty large like when you do multiple ones you have to do like more than one inch like one and a half inch hose even for the suctions once you get um to the multiple uh, suction requirements so so doing a bunch of bunch that are just um one inch one inch suction lines or even we could possibly even get away with three quarter then it's still still good yeah yeah so just continue that i think that's that's okay. a that's a workable very nice working idea yeah, I guess, uh, obviously the, the, the well the suction that they go at the bottom of the tank and then of course the return goes to the filter at the top um i guess you're 
the difficulty there is you're, you're having to cut or tap those to thread. No, no, we're just uh, torching. So once again, this is all torched. No, no, you don't have to. Uh, you have to weld something in. We're not tapping it in. Oh. That's once again, you get the CNC cut. All the holes are there, and you just weld them in, weld the fittings in. So that's that's been pretty easy okay. to do, especially oh, if the. Yeah. And you don't necessarily need them to be like a, a pinhole in there is actually okay, pinhole leak. Because if the returns are above the fluid line, you don't really, you don't have leak coming, leaks coming out of that if it's above the, the reservoir fluid line. Because the returns are pretty much close, close to the top. So that's actually not a problem in terms of manufacturability and preventing and the issue of pinhole leaks. So that, that makes it pretty easy. Yeah. See, is there, let's see, that, so that's multiple returns in section. So, yeah. uh, is there a filter? You don't need filter redundancy, right? You were saying, no. I think that no. the cooling, it's it's not a problem just to filter at once. One, yeah. It's all because of the rapid, or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because of the rapid, rapid turnaround, the, basically the large number of cycling times, you just literally need yeah. one filter uh, going back. We had it mounted directly to the, the filter was mounted directly to the reservoir. And yeah, as long as you have at least one filter, you're, you're able to filter all the fluid because of the cycling. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, I guess that answers most of my questions for all. Okay that document I'll change some things on the modularity because it says like the main difference is uh, the tanks and going back to the smaller coolers so that that should solve most of the issues yep um, I don't think I have to change the cube cube much so it, the frame is probably pretty good other than the tank Yep. So, okay. Right there, um, talk about the life track. Okay, more. let's um, let's move on then. I was looking at the arrangement. It looked like he had five cubes. On okay, so Roberto is on. Track. Yeah, Roberto uh, joined and us here. The arrangement, all that stuff will affect, I guess, cube. Well. Yeah, the, I mean, uh, let's worry about getting the correct power cube. Change anything about the cubes, but there's yeah. a lot of. Uh, Plumbing and maybe some concerns for positioning of things for all the hoses and all that. Yeah, I mean, there's so, going to be that's going to have to be all worked out, uh, but that's that that's addressable. Track. Yeah, that part is addressable by fittings. We can get the fittings to be to be correct to to make everything fit as we need to. Uh, let's see. Do you guys hear me? Looks like I'm cut out here. Can you hear me now? I got cut out there. Can you guys hear me?
Can you hear me, guys? Are you still making noise down there? When? Can I have 15 minutes? Guys, can you hear me? Um, Looks like everybody's having some connection issues almost. Oh, uh, yeah. Today, but Abe, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, let's continue here. Sorry, I, I'm just cutting out here still. Uh, okay. Um, but yeah, as far as all those plumbing issues, like Roberto's going to have whatever, whatever his geometry is. First, make sure that we've got good geometry on what we have with the power cube, I think. And then we can, because we can always put fittings on to turn things a certain way. I think probably the bigger constraint is um, how the power cube comes out in the first place. But then again, you do want to consider that, yes, we are going to have one big one on top and three other ones next to it. So kind of consider that. A little bit as well uh, when you're doing it just in a basic just just don't ignore that completely just know be aware that yes you will have to put several of these next to one another so you do have to let that influence your thinking just a little bit at, at the initial point um, but I think the more important thing is are things fitting in properly in general into the power cube as the number one constraint though there is the effect of how all the ones fit together after one power cube is is completely designed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. Now let's see. Let's uh, let's keep. Forty. Will simplify things. It'll yeah, be definitely. A lot like. It'll be somewhat like the, the previous one. It's going to be pretty close. Um, yeah. I'll just change the frame a little to enlarge the tank. That that'll be the only major difference. Yep. And I've got it where it's editable, so this shouldn't take me long. So, yeah, I think we should probably talk about the next thing because it shouldn't yeah. take me long to, to Definitely. organize that cube. Yep, so let's let's move on right here. So, Roberto, um, updates. Roberto, can you hear us? Or? Uh, yes. Yeah, so you, you've got the updated uh, live track and um, that all worked out? with the 12 inches of motion for the the tensioner let's see yeah yeah i uploaded the i raised the um, the position of the cylinders yes, and also the position for the um, the loader arms yep shaft yep. and yeah you can you can see the geometry and on, on, on the file is already uploaded Yep, yep, I see it. I think it looks pretty good. So we'll leave it at that. And are you working now on um, the 3D printer and everything is going okay? Or how's that going? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I have to to look for a um, square tubing to start um, welding the, the frame. I mean with the uh, JB weld. JB weld. Uh huh. So yeah, that that's, that is is my next step. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as um, let's see, I'm looking at the tractor there. Oh yeah. I guess 
Right, there's this one part on the, tr I'm looking at the tractor where the back, you've got the verticals for the tensioner, they're inside of the one, of that triangulating piece. And I guess that could be okay. Um, yeah, I think that's all right there. Yeah. I think the next step on here, I see you've got the core. Yeah, the three power cubes organized in this interesting fashion on the back, and the big one straddling the top. Yeah, I think we'll wait for Abe to be finished with the, maybe like add the, finish the power cube and then add it in real, like for real, how they would actually look more exactly, because right now that's pretty much placeholders. But with that, I think we're pretty good. We're pretty decent on that. Um, Yeah, I'll have to think about that just a little more, see if there's any issues. That one cylinder for the big, the big raising arm cylinder. That length of the the arm is, is quite long, but I mean, because it's triangulating, kind of making a triangle shape with the, with the raising cylinder, that may be okay. Uh, because like all the force is going to be where that cylinder is is attaching to the to the loader arm. That's where like all that force is going to be. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll leave it leave leave this at at that where we are right now. I think that's it's quite acceptable. Yeah. All right. Let's keep going. Okay, um, Ahmed, do you wanna do you wanna pipe in on uh, updates? Any questions that you have? Uh, uh, for the tractor, I don't have any something right now. But uh, for today, the planter, I'm looking for something to make a level uh, for uh, the heat bed. Okay, something a blended part also. Uh, but I, uh, when I finish it, I'll give you the proposal which I have. Okay. So, so what is the issue? The leveling of. Uh, leveling the heat bed. Okay. So, are you saying in addition to the, the sensor? No, it's not the sensor. I'm talking about the the uh, there is two bars are carrying the the heat bed, right? Aha! Uh -huh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, I the see. four points of contact, which is good to help the for calibration of oh, the because, the uh -huh, because you're saying that because the support, those two bars are close to each other, they can slant to one yeah. side or the other? Yeah. I see. So how it can help to... Okay. Uh, Did you... Uh, okay. Have you tried running the printer yet, or...? Yes, I have run the printer, but uh, the quality of the printer is not there now uh, because of the leveling. And I get some of uh, the expert people who are uh, working really in the 3D printer. And uh, all of them have agreed that the leveling is the issue. Okay. Do you have any pictures that you can share as far as what the results were so far? Uh, no, I don't have now. Actually, I uh, talked to them right now. Okay. But however, I, I, I sent the uh, Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please do make sure, like, if you get any results, I mean, that's, uh, let us see that so we can comment more effectively. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so look forward to seeing what you have. So that's about it for now, then, I guess. Uh, let's go through some of the questions and comments. Um, so what are the long-term goals on PowerCube design modularity? Um, I'm taking that's a your question. Uh, uh, so I'm for that. Uh, yeah, yeah. This point especially, uh, I have uh, a concern in our country. Uh, the the tractor. Uh, yeah. Is also having something like uh, the extra driven part can can uh, which will meet somehow uh, another functions. Okay. Uh, if I'm talking right, 
uh, like uh, it can take the, the power or the movement from the engine uh, via a shaft. Yeah. The shaft is using to have a lot of issues or a lot of things. Uh, could we have something like that in our uh, truck? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's that's easy to add. You just need uh, another valve in, integrated in the system. So right now, what we have is the system right now has two valves. Each are two channel valves, but just adding one downstream, that's that's an easy thing to do. So as soon as we, and in fact, I'll be showing that um, if not in the next few days, it would have to be a few weeks. As I said, I'm going traveling for the next two weeks. But uh, the PTO, basically power takeoff, what we'll do is, uh, first thing we'll do is we'll, we'll put a trencher on the front loader of the tractor and that will be driven by that power takeoff. So we'll be we'll be showing that pretty pretty soon. Okay, good. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Um, so, okay, that's good. So let's see. Uh, Abe, is that the power cube design modularity? Do we address that, or should we talk about that a little more here? I think we addressed that, and I guess we discussed. Yeah, I think we addressed both those because I wrote both those in there earlier. Uh, the next thing I'm writing. Mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes, like today, there was quite a bit of choppy audio and things like that, um, and uh, so I missed some things, and I may have uh, not, I think I started to listen to the meeting from last week, but it was uploaded, I think, later, and I didn't get to it, and I'm assuming that some of the, the communications issues are related to the limited data and the satellite connections, what it sounded like, and I know Eric was posting some more stuff about network on there, and I kind of mentioned it. Uh, what I thought about that, uh, but I, I don't know how you, if there's a need for more management of like the uploading so your data limits aren't hit. Um, no, no. To upload the meetings is, is handy too. I mean, it's, it, especially if the communications are a little rough in the meeting. Yeah. You need to reference the, you know, no, I, th I, I don't I know. know. I think, um, I mean, the, the recording here it's since it's recording on my screen it's it's relatively clear no right now basically what happened is my my internet got disconnected and and um i just haven't set it up yet because we we're doing a lot of work outside here while the weather was good so uh r right now i'm actually at the cd home on the on a satellite connection which ran out of data right now so i'm on a slow connection but no we should be getting that fixed up uh, relatively well. I'm not seeing much of an issue on a video upload. Like before the last two weeks, I think it was pretty good, right? Was that acceptable before? Well, I mean, the video quality, the, the meeting connection quality is always probably going to vary. So, it's, uh -huh. but if it takes, like, I assume that it was taking you like a whole week to up, get it uploaded, maybe because of the data limits. Affected, no. Uh, what? Have to tell it to upload overnight or something like that. I know there's like warning hours on satellite and all that. Yeah. So no, that that wasn't. Managed software. The thing that that was taking time typically is what I do is I compress the meeting because otherwise it's like two gig. So the only thing I could do is try to save the meeting at a lower resolution so that uh, I don't have to compress it. But what I do typically is compress, and that takes like four hours, and then I upload it. But no, I mean, there's unlimited so, upload, so. One thing I think I noted some before my login, I think about the networking too, otherwise on that page, was that I had success with, um, YouTube seemed to accept the uploading just fine of, of lower frame rate video. Yeah. Like I would record it though, formats with focus screen, and I was just doing like eight frames a second, uh, know settings for x264 and uh on Vorbis, which is the most open formats that i could find there right and and uploading that to youtube seemed okay uh -huh. the only problem i think i've had pretty Jitsi is i had some weird audio recording issues with Jitsi, but that, that's probably just my end i haven't figured it out yet but that that low frame rate produces really small files that might help okay and so that's one thing i can file. Okay, so I should try optimizing the settings within VocoScreen to make sure that we're 
not making those files so large. But we have to have pretty good sound. The sound is sound is pretty important. So yeah, the sound is important. I think. Okay, the but the video frame rate, we yeah, we could have that lower. That'll be that'll be fine. Yeah. I'll look into I, that. I think eight was fine. Okay. But eight is excessive because I don't know. I didn't really try lower than eight because I said, well, that's good enough. But for doing like the CAD and the recording, what's in Jitsi? I mean, do you really need more than a couple frames a second anyway? You know. Right. It's right. Not, as long as it syncs with, as long as it syncs with the audio and stuff, okay, mm -hmm. then it's fine. Okay. But yeah, I'll look into that. But yeah, I'll I'll try that for next time. I'll yeah. play with the settings because. Uh, um, it might help with the. Yeah, the would you say that? Speed. Okay, if we are to evaluate the quality of the meetings, like the internet connection, is it actually really problem problematic for people on the call? A lot, or is it typically just acceptable? Like just overall, the from all the meetings from before, during the meeting itself. For me, it it varies. Um, yeah. There was some spots today where I couldn't hear audio, and of course, a lot of times the video does seem to lag, and my connection right. isn't great either. I'm in a rural area on a wireless thing, but it's my connection is usually okay during the day. Okay. It's, you know, very peak things on my end, but um, it's mostly okay. There's a little bit of audio breaks up. Okay. And I, most of the time, it looks like in the YouTube videos, I can hear enough more information from your end and so on that yeah. the information isn't there, there. Okay. That sounds good. Well, so we'll, I'll look into the better recording on a vocal screen settings. Okay, as far as the question number two here, improvements in CAD design logistics prior to workshops, better details, uh, is that, um, we, the bottom line is on, on getting better logist, like a better CAD and documentation on workshops, it's because a lot of designs are changing and evolving is, is where we have like some mixed documentation, some from prior workshops and some from updated designs but this all leads to I mean improving our design and documentation capacity I mean we're I don't think we're there yet as far as where we need to be and then uh, so we got to keep building the team and it's like we have to think about so maybe as we go into next year we want to think about reevaluating after this whole year of, of activity how can we scale the team up and how how can we do a better job constantly improving Thinking about radical solutions, like kind of, I like to think about 10x. Like, how do we get it 10 times better, not just a little bit better, not 10% better, but 10 times better? So we definitely want to think about how to do that. But yeah, I mean, it's you know constant process, and as we stabilize some of these designs and we get closer to final, it gets easier and easier. I think it's getting a little easier through time, and um, it's it's just a long process. I mean, we've got so much on our plate that uh, it just takes time. So. Anyway, well, that's good. So, so anyway, to uh, to sum up for today, let's I think let's let's end here. As I mentioned, some of you didn't make the beginning of the meeting, but next two weeks I'll be traveling to Costa Rica to check out the workshop opportunity down there and a potential replication site. But the idea is let's let's uh, take a break for the next two weeks. Continue on doing what you what you can. I'll be in and out on the internet. Uh, I'll be I'm leaving on Saturday, but. Um, I'll have some internet access so we can take a little break and then, then get back to it and we're planning for an ambitious um, schedule for next year and as far as workshops in different locations. So with that said, um, I think um, that'll be good. Let's let's keep going at it, you know, continue what you can. And I'm doing a bit of planning for next year to see how we can move forward in a better way uh, and continue going. So thanks a lot and we'll see you soon. So email me if you've got any questions and we'll continue. We can continue on the Slack as you mentioned. There's a Slack channel that that Slack set up and we can continue on email and Slack in the meantime. All right. Thanks a lot everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Have a good meeting. Bye. Yep, bye bye. And Ruslan, we've got you next. Um, so let's let's talk. Yes, Ruslan. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? 
Yes, yes, I can. That's good. I use this for the first time. Okay. Some yeah, no, it's it's good. Do you have a video camera on you, or can you? I have a video camera. No, wait, um, I with the Yeah. I will switch it on. Yeah, and I'm stopping.